As we move deeper into the Apostles' Creed, I invite you to open your Bible to Matthew chapter 24, verses 29 through 31. Matthew 24, 29 through 31. Norwood Russell Hansen, don't know if you've heard of him or not, he's an atheist philosopher, and he said, I'm not a stubborn guy, I would become a theist, a believer, under some conditions, I'm open-minded. And then he went on to lay out the conditions under which he would believe. He said, suppose next Tuesday morning, just after breakfast, all of us in this one world are knocked to our knees by a percussive and ear-shattering thunderclap. Snow swirls, leaves drop from trees, the earth heaves and buckles, buildings topple and towers tumble, the sky is ablaze with an eerie light, and just then as all the people of the world look up, the heavens open, the clouds are pulled apart, revealing an unbelievably radiant and immense Zeus-like figure towering over us like a hundred Everests. He frowns darkly as lightning plays across the features of his Michelangeloid face, and then he points down at me, and he explains for every man, woman, and child to hear, I've had quite enough of your too clever logic chopping and word watching in matters of theology. Be assured, nor would Russell Hansen, that I most certainly do exist. Hansen doesn't realize it, but that day is coming. The day of reckoning the day of judgment, the day when Jesus rends the heavens and comes down. The creed says it this way, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. Jesus says the same thing with these words in our text. Hear the word of the Lord. Immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not shed its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and then all the peoples of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He will send out his angels with a loud trumpet and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. We've heard these words so many times that they, they pass right by us. But these words ought to put the fear of God in believer and unbeliever alike. The day is coming. The day of cosmic upheaval that takes place when Jesus finally says enough to sin and enough to Satan. And he makes his grand entrance that all of the world will see. In 1971, Bill Withers released his famous song, Ain't No Sunshine When She's Gone. Well, we hear a different song in our text, Ain't No Sunshine When He Comes. Jesus says, immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon uh, will not shed its light. Stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Jesus is employing Old Testament apocalyptic day of the Lord language here. Isaiah, Ezekiel, Joel, Haggai, Zechariah language. This is quite a picture this is no secret rapture of the church, angels zipping here and there. This is no secret coming in the clouds. This is very visible coming on the clouds. Angels zipping around heaven and earth, heaving like a drunk, a loud trumpet blaring. There's nothing quiet or secret about this coming. This is the one and only second coming there is consistent with the Old Testament prophets, with 1 Thessalonians and with Revelation. Though Jesus' prediction of the destruction of Jerusalem is also part of this chapter in Matthew, these words in our text are more than that. Jesus is talking cosmic upheaval, as if the universe is a blanket, God picks it up and shakes it out. There's uproar in the heavens, powerful empires are thrown into chaos. And if you're scared of thunderstorms now, you better keep an extra pair of pants handy when Jesus comes, <laughs> because you are going to need them on this terrifying day. It's 10 on the Richter scale, terrifying. It's F5 tornado, Cat 5 hurricane, terrifying. It's 50 foot tsunami, terrifying. No wonder Jesus says that when he, the Son of Man, comes, amid all of this chaos, all the peoples on the earth will mourn. A lot of folks are in for a huge surprise when Jesus comes back. Those who think there is no God, surprise. 
There is. Those who think Jesus is just another prophet or a good teacher, uh, surprise, he is Lord. Those who think that this world as it is and life as, as it is will go on forever, surprise, it doesn't. And those who think they have all the time in the world to prepare themselves for the end, surprise, they don't. Suddenly, like a thief in the night, Jesus will come. No self-respecting thief in the world is going to call you up and say, hey, I'm planning my schedule for next week. Uh, I wanted to check with you. Would robbing you on Thursday night or Friday morning be more convenient? See, that's not going to happen. Nor will Jesus call ahead when he comes. He will come suddenly like a thief in the night when you hear the unsettling sounds of glass shattering or a door creeping open. Jesus says when he comes, the sun will go dark, the moon will lose its light, stars will fall, and God will shake heaven and earth like a baby's rattle. Now serious Bible students ask, is this language in our text, is it literal or is it uh, metaphorical? I like the way Morna Hooker puts it. She says it's more than metaphorical and it's less than literal. It is theophany language, apocalyptic language, language we don't take literally, but we do take seriously. And it's the language of cosmic upheaval and fruit basket, fruit basket turnover in nature. And as the phrase in our text, the powers of heaven suggest, pagan empires are thrown into chaos and overturned. It will no longer and never again be business as usual when Jesus comes to judge the living and the dead. Jesus is coming back. Look at the first part of verse 30. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then, then, and then. Fred Bruner takes note of the two thens in this one verse. The labor contractions are getting closer and closer. The present age is dying fast. The new age is making its way through the birth canal. The beat of the drum moves from half notes to quarter notes to eighth notes quicker, faster, picking up tempo, picking up volume. The clock tick, tick, ticking down to zero hour. Jesus is coming back. The sign of the Son of Man is Jesus himself in person, in that glorified, resurrected body that ascended to heaven, the Jesus that we can see and touch. He said he would come. For centuries we have believed his promise of that great day of his return. But when that day comes, the promise is fulfilled and our faith becomes sight and our waiting will be over. Jesus will no longer be, his coming will no longer be a blessed hope. It will be a present reality. Jesus is coming back. And when, he, when Jesus comes, he comes to judge. Listen to all of verse 30. Then the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the peoples of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Jesus returns with power and great glory. This time, no sneaking down the back steps of Bethlehem, no coming to earth as an infant who can't feed himself, clean himself, or do one thing to take care of himself. You don't see much power in that coming. And only a handful of shepherds, a few Persian magi, and Mary and Joseph even caught a glimpse of Jesus' glory at his birth. But when Jesus comes the second time, he comes with power and great glory. And all the peoples of the earth will mourn. Sounds like judgment, doesn't it? Now there's some debate among scholars as to whether this mourning is the grief of regret or the grief of repentance. Does Jesus' second coming mark the end of any chance for people to repent or does it provide a moment for one last chance? The Bible teaches us that God is slow to anger that he is full of mercy, he's patient beyond measure, that he longs for people to repent from their sins and to put their trust in him and find life and salvation in him. But God's patience has limits, and sooner or later, chances end and the door to heaven closes. And it's, it's safe to say, I think, don't you, that most anyone on this side of the second coming who refuses to repent from sin and turn to Christ will probably not do so when Jesus comes again. I mean, they've already demonstrated they have no heart for God, no desire for repentance, no interest in turning from their sins to Jesus. In Revelation 16, the angel pours out God's wrath in the fourth and fifth bowls of judgment on the inhabitants of the earth who do not love God, and yet, Revelation says, they still do not repent. Don't assume you can wait to the last second 
If you don't know and love God, repent today. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the only sure thing you have. Repent today. Because the day is coming when it will be too late to repent. One day the door of salvation and life and heaven will close. Now Matthew spends chapter 25 telling Jesus stories about that. There are ten bridesmaids, he says. Five wise, five foolish. The foolish weren't ready when the bridegroom came to take them to the wedding. They came late, they bang on the door, but they are shut out forever. There are three servants. Before the master left, for some indefinite time, he gave the first servant $5,000, gave the second servant $2,000, gave the third servant $1,000. Do business with this till I return, he said. First two servants put their master's money to work and exponentially multiplied his resources. But the third servant, he buried his $1,000. And when the master unexpectedly shows up, it's judgment time. Servants have to give an account for what they did with his money. He rewards the first two servants. He kicked the untrusting, do-nothing servant into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. One day, the door of salvation will be shut Shut tight, locked from the inside. And if you aren't in there, when the door closes, you are left out forever. Jesus is coming to judge, so repent today. Or when Jesus comes, he will not come for you as your Savior. He will come for you as your judge. Judgment is on the horizon. It'll be here sooner than you think. So repent today. Don't be a part of the peoples of the earth that will mourn when they see the Son of Man clump coming on the clouds with great glory, and power. But don't be smug about this either, Christian, because the Bible teaches that Jesus will judge believers too. It won't be about our destiny. It'll be about our works. Our destiny is settled when we turn from our sins and trust the crucified, resurrected Christ to save us. He does save us. He gladly saves us. He wants to save us. So I'm not making light of Jesus' judgment of our works, but that is a very different Judgment from the kind that he talks about in our text, the kind of judgment that causes the peoples of the earth to mourn. Jesus provides a metaphor of the way God judges works in Matthew 25, 31 through 46. It's his parable about the sheep and goats. The sheep serve Jesus gladly in caring for the least and the lost, and Jesus rewards them for their service. And they learn that when they served the least, they were serving Jesus. But the goats... They wouldn't recognize Jesus if they ran into him on the street. Whatever good they did, they always did for personal benefit and glory. And Jesus says of the goats in Matthew 25, 45 through 46, I tell you, whatever you did not do to one of the least of these, you did not do for me. And then Jesus says, they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So don't be counted among the peoples of the earth who mourn when Jesus appears. You don't have to be. Repent of your sin. Put your trust in Jesus. He will save you. He will give you his righteousness. He will give you eternal life. I sound the alarm this morning. Jesus is coming. And when he does, he comes to judge. But he also is coming to save Listen to verse 31. He will send out his angels with a loud trumpet and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. The term elect is a large word. It means God's elect faithful everywhere and in all times and generations of history. And Jesus says that the elect will be gathered from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. That's a colloquialism in that day that simply means from every nook and cranny of the earth. Jesus is teaching us here about the rapture of his people, that gathering of God's people of all time, those he brings with him from heaven and those who are still living on the earth, buried in the ground, scattered in ashes when he comes. This is all one movement. This is one event. When Jesus comes down, he doesn't snatch his people from the earth to linger with him in the clouds for seven years. There's nothing in this text that indicates that. When Jesus comes down, he comes all the way down and he gathers his people of all time, living and dead on that great day of Jesus' return and our resurrection. What a day that will be. Every believer will be a part of that. Is that Abraham and David there at Jesus' side? 
I think I see Peter and Mary Magdalene and Paul. Well, there's Jacob and Aline King and Amy Gamble and Pat Hines and George Higdon and Ella Schmidt and Edie Counts and Larry Stanley and Dick Wilkerson and, and, and Craig Holmes and, and all of those that we love who are coming down with Jesus. And look to your right. There's James and Amy O'Neill laughing with their daughter Anna. There's Jim and Amanda Morgan embracing Tyler. There's Paul and Catherine Russell getting acquainted, reacquainted with their little daughter Caroline Grace. And there's Jan and Tommy White in a group hug with Ryan. There's John and Mary Vitro hugging on Ty. Jesus is coming to save coming to finish what he started and what he secured when he was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven where he sits at the right hand of the Father and he will come to judge the living and the dead. Jesus is coming to make good on his promises and to complete his full-scale redemption and remake of his people and remake of his tired, groaning, old creation. Jesus is coming to save. Coming to save, coming to judge. But don't miss the central truth. Jesus is coming. It's not so much much a matter of when or a matter of what. It's a matter of who. Jesus is coming again. Does this good news, does it... Does it ignite your joy or does it dampen your spirit? It's comfortable here. And so some would rather hang on to this world because it's where most of your investments are. I mean, be it ever so humble, there's no place like home, right? This home, this world, this earth, just as it is with its problems, with its sins, with its brokenness. And some of us are so attached to this world that the second coming of Jesus feels more like a threat than like the blessed hope. In his book, The Oldest Confederate Confederate Widow Tells All, Alan Gerganus describes through the perspective of a southern Confederate widow Sherman's violent, destructive march through the South near the end of the war. And for Southerners, Sherman's march was more than mere war. It was an apocalyptic nightmare, pretty much burning everything in his path. The people gathered in the town square in stunned disbelief, and this is what they'd mourned, the end of the South. The end of the South. But across town, slaves were dancing in the streets. I wonder, I wonder where you are in all of this. Will Jesus coming be for you a time of mourning or a time of a jig of joy? Be honest. Some of you are just too invested in this doomed planet to embrace the hope and to feel the joy you're just too content with status quo. That goes for pastors too. We pastors can get as co-opted as anyone else into thinking this world is all there is. Professor friend of mine said, pastors are no longer prophets announcing the advent of a whole new world. We're helping professionals trying to fix this one. I want to be a prophet today. Jesus is coming. New world is coming. Sin and evil will be destroyed forever. Justice will be served. No more sorrow, no more sin, no more Satan. And justice will be fully served. And all of God's people from every generation of history will live together with Him and serve Him and worship Him forever in happy harmony and unbridled joy. Jesus is coming. A new world is coming. So be ready. Be ready. In the larger apocalyptic sermon from which this text comes, Jesus makes clear in both parable and proposition how we can be ready. Stick to the mission. Share the gospel. Take it across the street. Take it around the world. Earlier in this chapter in Matthew 24, 14, Jesus says this good news of the kingdom will be proclaimed in all the world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come. Stick to the mission. Do your part as an individual. We'll try to do our part as a church. Stick to the mission and live with anticipation. Let's be wise and live with the awareness that the absent master is coming back. 
So live in obedience to Jesus. Invest your best time, your best energy, your best gift, your finances in the kingdom that lasts forever. Keep alert for that great and awesome day when the sun and moon grows dark, when stars fall, the universe shakes, and Jesus comes down in power and great glory. And live in such hope and anticipation of that great day when Jesus comes that he will find you dancing rather than mourning. That he will find you reaching your hands toward him rather than clutching this tired old earth. Live in anticipation. So be ready. Are, are you ready for this day? 1938, a New England man went to the hardware store to buy a barometer. He took it home. He put it in a study window. He set it according to all the instructions. He came back later in the day to check the barometer to see what the weather was going to be that evening. He smiled because the barometer said there was going to be a hurricane. He took it off the wall. He went back to the store to return it. Uh, what's wrong with it? The shopkeeper asked. Well, a lousy barometer you sold me, it doesn't, doesn't work. Tells me there's going to be a hurricane. Shopkeeper took it, looked it over. Sure enough, that's what it said. He apologized to the customer. He offered to either get it fixed or, or give him a refund of his money. The man took the refund and headed home. And that evening, his home was blown away by the great New England hurricane of 1938. You checked your barometer lately? Con the, the contractions are intensifying. God's judgments are falling on the earth. Evil on the throne, good on the gallows. Nations in an uproar, war and rumor of war, heat waves and droughts, fires and floods, old line churches in decline, many turning from the faith, many giving up on Christ, Jesus' people persecuted by pagan powers, and yet all the time the gospel is being preached to almost every nation. In, in Cormac McCarthy's No Country for Old Man, Sheriff Bell says, I wake up sometimes way in the night and I know as certain as death that there ain't nothing short of the second coming of Christ that can slow this train. Jesus is coming to judge the living and the dead, coming to save his people, coming to bring down the new heaven and the new earth. A new world is coming and it will be here sooner than you think. So church, embrace your blessed hope. Set your affections on things above. Share the gospel and lift up your head because your redemption is drawing near. Thank you, Father, for the promise. A promise you made a long time ago. A promise your church has been waiting for you to fulfill for a couple of millennia. We don't know when it's coming. We do know that it's coming. We know that you are coming. So ready our hearts, ready our hearts to be a people prepared and ready for your coming. In Jesus' name, amen.